What's up, everybody? How are you? Que Lasso with Heath Pierce. The couch of countdown clock is ticking towards a Serie A season that promises to hold more intrigue for the U.S. audience than any before it. And on the pitch and in the boardrooms, the American influence in the Italian top flight has never been stronger. Serie A, which is, by the way, at Paramount Plus and CBS Sports, now has more American talent. And today, Heath Pierce, my man Heath Pierce, joins me to discuss four Serie A players looking to impress US MNT head honcho Greg Berhalter ahead of a very heavy slate of World Cup qualifiers, as well as the recent influx of American ownership groups in Italy's top division. Kego Lasso begins right now. Welcome everybody to Kego Lasso. Heath Pierce, how are you, my man? I am doing well. I'm uh, I'm I'm just excited. I'm excited. We did a weekend recap uh, over the weekend, which means that the insanity of the seasons are beginning again. And uh, now we're talking Americans in Syria, which was never a subject before. Now it was in American or a uh, American, and now we're talking about plural Americans. It's great. That's absolutely uh, great, and we're going to get right into it. As we mentioned, Syria, of course, which by the way is home right here. Paramount Plus is the home of Syria. In the U.S. and CBS Sports, I'll talk about it in a second. Before we get started, thank you all so much for tuning in to Heath and yours truly. If you are enjoying this on YouTube, uh, we apologize for the faces, but hey, thank you for joining. If you're enjoying this on the pod, I mean, how could you not? It costs nothing to like and subscribe to it, so please do that. Okay, while you're at it, leave a little Kego Lasso glowing review and a five star rating on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us to grow the show and our audience uh, wherever. Whatever platform you're listening to, please try and show some love. Every little helps. All right, Heath Pierce, I'm about to do my Serie A plug. Are you ready, baby? Are oh, you yeah. ready for some Serie A? Let's Here go. we go. Paramount Plus is your home for soccer, and now it's your home for Calcio. Stream every match of Serie A, Italy's top league, featuring some of the world's best clubs, including Juventus, Inter Milan, AC Milan, a is Roma, Napoli, and so many more. Plus, some of the world's biggest stars like Cristiano Ronaldo, Slatan Ibrahimovic, the beautiful face of Olivia Giroud, Weston McKinney, and many, many more. With live matches and heart pounding CBS sports coverage, you don't want to miss. Italy is the king of Europe. Serie A is a glowing, growing, beautiful animal, and it kicks off opening weekend, August 21 and 22nd, streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus CBS Sports. Heath, how excited are you about Serie A, baby? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a new Serie A we're talking about, right? You, you know, and, and I know you, you're, you're going to be covering it all the time, but just the, the fact that an Atalanta is so exciting and so well-known in the U.S. now because of their attacking-minded, goal-scoring, whatever. It's just an incredible time to be a Serie A fan. It's an incredible time to know that it's available uh, very easily on Paramount+. Plus. So I'm excited to, to, to follow it. And obviously, we've got our own uh, connective tissue into the league with Americans now uh, dominating, hopefully. And a beautiful segue. You just did that for me, uh, Heath Pierce, because that is the episode of today. We want to give you a little... Historical context here, everybody, uh, and why Heath and I are going to discuss. Before Weston McKinney joined Juve, Heath, only five Americans had previously featured in Serie A. Can you name them for me, Heath Pierce? Do you know the five Americans before uh, Weston McKinney? I don't have that document in front of me, but I could name them if you if you allowed me to go back to that document. I will say there's only one um, one fun fact, and and I'll let you 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 name him. Some of them are 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 actually from the 30s and 40s or like, you know, a long time ago. Yeah. One of the players uh, ended up fighting for Italy in World War II and and unfortunately uh, dying in, in the war was captured by the Nazis. Um, I, uh, I'll let you say say the name. I, I said I want to disrespect it, but there's some really interesting history there, a small history for Americans, um, but uh, a really interesting history uh, of Americans over the last hundred years. We've got five, not a great uh, number to, to go off of, but Hopefully, uh, we've got lots more coming soon. Absolutely. Hey, listen, uh, that's a really good story, by the way. I wish, I hope we do some kind of cool documentary about that, uh, about the player that you were talking about. But we have Alexi Lalas, that was before the McKenny era, Michael Bradley, of course, Joshua Perez, and Armando Frigo, mm -hmm. and the American born Italian player, Alfonso Negro, uh, born in Brooklyn. Uh, died in Florence in, in 84, and his story is incredible. And hey, listen, 
Those are five before the Western McKinney era. And now, listen, our friend Oguchi Onyewu played for AC Milan, but he never made a league appearance, only that one Champions League appearance. That's why we have a little asterisk with him. But now, Keith, now as we're looking at this new league, this new season, um, you know, I want to talk about a real brand, on-brand team right now, Venezia, the newly promoted team. They're U.S. owned, okay, continuing the good work of previous president, uh, Joe Tacopina, who basically steered the club to back-to-back promotions and turned the club into a super lifestyle brand. I want that shirt. Venezia people, if you're listening, watching this, I need that shirt, okay? It's ridiculous, all right? And now their current president, uh, Duncan Niederauer, uh, is doing tremendous things as well as, you know, Venezia Sanetti and what he's doing in Serie A. And they have two Americans. Let's begin with the first one, Heath Pierce. Gianluca Busio, central midfielder, 19 North Carolina, there's a lot here. He had a good start in gold cup. He faded a little bit later on. How, how do you see this player? How will he suit Serie A? It, what, what do you make of this Busio and Venezia move? I think it's a good a good move. I think Serie A in general or the stereotype uh, fits the style of play that he plays with, right? Rhythmic, uh, good on the ball, good at understanding where the exits are in terms of breaking pressure and the buildup and things like that. I think... The reverse side of that is also a negative in terms of uh, of the way that he plays and that he still feels a little bit of a luxury player in terms of his impact overall on a game. You know, if you're going to take a central midfield spots, there's a reason that we see very few number 10s anymore. You start to see some of these hybrid sort of eight and a halves or, uh, you know, nine and a halves. You're seeing all these hybrid roles now because you can't have a luxury player on the field anymore unless they are uh, a godsend. Right. And and he doesn't have that yet. But we saw flashes of that in the Gold Cup. I think for decent uh, periods, uh, he, he was good on the ball, obviously clean. I think in transition, he was still a little bit slow. I think Greg Berhalter lit a little bit of a fire under him uh, after he struggled against, uh, I think it was Canada uh, in, in the Gold Cup, where he started to have a little bit more of a defensive presence, a little more of a fight to him. And so those are all things that are all about mentality, right? They're still young enough where you can get them into an environment and start to shape that mentality. You can't change his physical stature, but we saw with Brendan Aronson, who was also a smaller player, learn to play to his strengths. And I think the more that Gianluca Busio can think faster, play faster, and not get himself into positions where it's a 50-50 battle or a scrap, uh, I think it's going to play to his advantage. But obviously, he's now in a high-pressure environment. He's no longer going to be considered this up-and-coming player that somebody's going to sell. He obviously signed at a very young age. Um, and so he's going to have to prove himself. And I think that's going to bring out the best or worst in him, uh, we are yet to see. But I, I certainly think he has a lot of tools to not just be a contributor to Venezia and keeping them in Serie A, but also has a huge upside in terms of being, you know, considered one of the better attacking players in, in Serie A coming through the midfield. Yeah, they called him the American Pirlo, right? And then yeah. I remember you saying that he's a move the chains kind of guy, kind of likes to slow the game down a little bit. Yeah, he's he is a rhythmic type of player, really good in tight spaces, half spaces, no, knows what's going on. The issue with a player like that is that you have to build a, a system around him because he wants to be able to have a player on his back and lay it off one time, or he wants to be in those constant triangles where you're solving problems through passing and creating these numerical advantages. And so if you get him into these positions where he's got to be more of your workhorse up and back, up and back, and just sort of you know, playing to play and he's not connected to high quality players around him that that sort of understand where the next play is, he can be a little bit neutralized. And so it's going to be really important. And I know obviously Tanner Tessman, another central midfielder that hopefully they get time together playing at Venezia and Serie A can do some of that work for him and put him into better, better spots so that, you know, when you think about uh, Pirlo, you think about that sort of 10 on offense and and or 10 on defense, six on offense, where he wants to come back, get the ball off the center back's feet and really start the rhythm of the game and then sort of drift away from some of that more defensive work and just sort of plug holes and block passing lanes and things like that and save his energy for some of that more um, technical stuff. And so, again, that's a bit of a luxury. There's only one Pirlo. I think that's a little bit of a, you know, uh, a, overstatement. A, a, yeah, yeah, an overstatement and a North Star. But in terms of the way you see him play and the way that he, he, he likes to play, it's a great reference, except that now he's got to take 10 steps to get there and really, really be impactful uh, over long periods if he wants to be an American peerless. Yeah, well, from one midfielder to another one, let's talk about another center mid, 19 years old as well, Alabama native, Tanner Tessman. They nickname him Tanner the Tank. And when you look at a video of him and highlights and images, you can see why. Unlike Weston McKenney, 
who also cut his teeth uh, at FC Dallas, who also started his uh, grassroots uh, training there. Tessman stuck around long enough to get some uh, MLS experience, nearly 30 appearances, did 26, almost accepted a scholarship offer from Clemson. He to be a kicker before signing for Dallas. There's a family history there, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at Josh Lambeau, there probably wasn't a bad decision when he left playing professional soccer to go be a kicker now with the Jaguars and one of the best kickers in the league and making a lot of money. So from a financial standpoint, you are certainly risking something being a top level kicker that co go to a big club. But I think obviously soccer is his passion. Uh, I go back to Tanner Tessman at the Olympics where he wasn't getting the looks that I thought he, he would get. I thought he deserved to be in that Olympic squad. I didn't think he was quite a national team player. There was a lot of uh, kind of talk about where he fits into the U.S. soccer landscape. And the times that he got in uh, for the Olympic qualifying, which the U.S. ultimately failed to, to qualify for the Olympics, as we know, he was really good pushing the ball forward, engaging defenders. His long range of passing really made him unique to me in that he was still young. He's obviously got this physical presence. He can cover a lot of ground. Uh, and those are all things that you, you'll never be able to take away from him, right? But can you start to add little pieces to your game that make you a game changer, especially when you're talking about Syria, right? He could stay in Dallas and be considered for the next three, four years as this young sort of up and coming player. But uh, now, now he's got a new challenge in front of him and you're playing for a team that can't have bad mistakes. And by the way, to go back to Busio, the bad mistakes will cost you in Syria, right? We mm -hmm. saw with the national team, as, they got, as the opponents got better, a bad square ball or not sharpness in your passing or in possession can cost you in Syria. And, and especially when, when you're vulnerable and your team is spread out trying to build up and play. So I think that's going to be a learning thing for him. To go back to Tessman, you know, he's actually, Debo Sweeney uh, is his godfather. So he's got some, you know, heritage and royalty in, in, in college sports. But I think he's built to be a, a central midfielder. And I actually think he complements Busio well and allowing Busio to find better spots on the field instead of having to get really, really deep in the buildup, he can now be connected to a holding midfielder that's maybe blocking those lanes a little bit more defensive minded and start to pick and choose those moments where he can get the ball and connect to, to go forward. And, and we've seen with a lot of high quality players as they drift back to a back line, uh, they become less effective. Whereas a testman, he's going to be that Tanner, uh, the tank uh, sitting in front of a back <laughs> line, you know, uh, we, we go back to the old uh, libero uh, positions and stuff where he, you know, he's going to be able to, to, to service this team a lot. He's already made a, his debut in the Coppa Italia for, for Venezia and just all around has, has a high quality uh, of play and, and is a physical specimen that I think can, can at a minimum, when you're talking about a Venezia who may not be playing beautifully and may be facing some hard times throughout the season, just looking to survive, uh, a, a key part of, of somebody that knows that like at a minimum, we're going to fight and scrap for every single ball. Um, and then he can start to add things to his game. Again, as I mentioned before, good range of passes, good passer of the ball, but um, you know, again, has to add, start adding some, some of these other pieces if you want to be a consistent Serie A player. If you want to start to get a sniff into the national team under Greg Berhalter, because you're, you're talking about a Tyler Adams that's in front of him, Kellen Acosta. Both those guys have engines. Tanner Sessman has an engine. But uh, Tyler Adams, good on the ball. Kellen Acosta, not as great on the ball in the buildup. So if you want to challenge in those spots or create a different dynamic, you have to add some of those pieces to your game to make yourself uh, indispensable from uh, Greg Berhalter. You know Venezia uh, well, Heath, right? Because you've done uh, a few projects with him. We know the history. So is this a good uh project for them and vice versa i guess because you know we were talking about josh Sargent in north city and you know the minutes he might get and might not get you know behind pookie etc here a, a new team to city once again uh a, a city that obviously well known around the world but what's the culture there how is this going to help them and vice versa yeah so i spent a, a lot of time in in venice and it's a unique community. They have one of the oldest stadiums. It's obvious. I think it's being renovated right now uh, as we speak uh, to make it Serie A prepared. I went to a Parma versus Venezia game that was insane. It's a really unique experience in that the players arrive on boats uh, to arrive at the stadium. Fans come on boats. It's a really cool uh, experience. Now, Serie A is going to be completely different and the expectations are going to ultimately be higher. But the club is approaching it very differently, right? We saw with Roma when, when they first... Uh, emerged with uh, uh, Jim Pallotta and the American ownership group that they had prior, they wanted to be everyone's second favorite team. And I thought that was a really unique perspective, but I, I felt Roma were a bit too big to be everyone's second favorite team, uh, a bit too well-known. Uh, again, whether that was successful or not, you would have to ask them. But Venezia have this very lifestyle-driven approach. You have this unique city where there's not a bad shot, not a bad view in the entire city. It's historic. It's unique in the fact that 
a, a city that big and that historic didn't have a Serie A team consistently um, every single year. Obviously, they've gone through their own sort of just like a lot of teams in Italy, their own financial hardships and had to be dropped to, to lower divisions and start from scratch. But they've got this American ownership group, um, a new American ownership group. They've got plenty of resources. They were trying to bring the team and stadium to the mainland. That was uh, uh, you know, uh, a difficult uh, venture just because obviously everything in Italy is a historic site. So building, it's not like uh, you know, uh, Tanner Testament coming from FC Dallas where the Hunt family goes out into the suburbs and goes, we're going to put a stadium here. Uh, yeah. And then we're going to build all this stuff around it. And then houses are going to come up. And then the Cowboys are going to come to the... It's, there's yeah. nowhere to go, right? And so it's, it's more difficult. But the club itself has a really unique and cool approach, lifestyle, uh, Diego Moscassoni, uh, who's who's a creative director and founder of Fly Nowhere, who, you know, a designer designed the, the jerseys. And so it's got a really unique, cool uh, streetwear influence. It's got a lifestyle influence that I think is going to be appealing if you're a fan who loves the game and are looking for a Serie A team um, and and don't know where to fit in. Uh, it's the place. Also, Joe Takapina, by the way, was a defense attorney for A-Rod when he was part of the club. He was also part of the Bologna ownership group, was pushed out by Joey Saputo, who's a Canadian that owns Montreal Impact or uh, Mon uh, FC Montreal now. Um, and so, and then he was part of Roma before. And so uh, the controversy that happens in Italy is, is a really wild thing. It's the last league I feel in the world where owners are still front-facing. Owners give press conferences after games. We're like, you don't really see that anymore, right? And so all that drama, I think, will make this a really exciting thing. But now the next ownership group is now uh, taking Venezia to the next stage. And it's a really exciting time. And again, bringing in Americans, such a great strategy for a club that a lot of people don't know really bringing that American ownership group and influence. I, I think it's got this unique feel for people who are a little bit of a soccer light or, ha or aren't sort of jaded by a team that they already select, uh, support to, to find a place in and, and, and follow young players in Serie A. So yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a, a run on there, but uh, yeah. No, it's a good one. It's a good one. This is why we do this, baby. We like to have the context. I do wonder though, Heath Beers, because we're talking about Italy. I, I know the nation well enough. I've, I've been there many, many times, especially the South. But Venice, to me, seems like, aside from all the historical context and culturally is beautiful, aesthetically beautiful, how accepting are they of American ownership specifically in this moment, because, you know, you talked about Pelota a little bit with uh, Roma. He wasn't necessarily loved by everybody there yeah. as well. And also, it's not just Venezia. We're going to talk about it in a second. But also, you know, you mentioned uh, Parma. That's U.S. owned, by the way, as well. So, you know, how is this American ownership being uh, received, I guess, uh, in Italy? It's a mixed bag, right? Uh, it just depends. Uh you know, Joe Takapina was more of a face of the club when he was at Venezia. You know, we in our documentary, which we were we were sent a cease and desist on, uh, where we said he was controversially ousted uh, from Bologna and 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 Roma uh, by by Joe Takapina's team, uh, being that he is a lawyer, didn't like the the language of that. Very you know, attorney language. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he he was. It was a mixed bag, right? When he was in, when they they want you to immerse yourself in the culture, they want you to be part of it. He was a figurehead and and they had grand ambitions that were hard to follow through on, right? When you make big promises to people in terms of an, a new, like a, an old stadium feels great to us. But if you're a team that wants to own your stadium, you know what the financial uh, uh, benefit could be of the few teams that actually own their stadiums in Syria. Very few. I think it's only two teams in Syria that own their uh, own their stadiums. It's it's uh, Juventus and I can't remember who, who else, but maybe it's Atalanta. The rest of the teams don't own their stadium. So it's rented by the city. You lose a lot of revenue in those contexts. So you make these big promises you got to follow through on. Jim Pilata, same thing. Or Pilota was 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 a mixed bag in terms of um, the way he was received. And again, that was a big stadium promise as well that they were trying to get through. Uh, that creates a lot more sustainability for these clubs. And so it really just depends on the tone, the commitment to the club. That obviously, um, Joe Takapina was actually a hands-on owner. He spent a lot of time in Italy. He was there for a lot of the games. Uh, and so the Italian people want you to embrace their culture, respect the history of their club, not try to destroy it, but try to improve it and and, and move it forward. And so it's always going to be a, a a mixed bag. And what that means in the context of Tanner Testman and Gianluca Busio is uncertainty, right? I played in a club that was newly promoted into the Bundesliga. We went through three coaches in a season. The drama and theater of it all is even more amplified in, in Italy. They've got no problem getting rid of coaches and changing coaches. Even club legends they'll get rid of uh, in, in the middle of a season. And so... 
that can create a lot of hardships, right? A lot of uncertainty where you've got to prove yourself to one coach, or maybe you're out of favor and you've got to find a way back in and you're fighting relegation. And maybe they'll be your Leeds United and just go mid table and up for, for the entirety of the season. But it's going to be um, very, very difficult uh, to do that. And those are some of the, when you're 19 years old, things that you don't have a blueprint for, right? You've been raised in a pretty nurtured environment in Dallas and Kansas City. You haven't had to really, you compete for spots, but you don't have a player older than you that you're competing with and a player coming up from the academy that's going to steal your spot and those types of things. So there's a number of those things. And then you add ownership and the drama of all that um, and resources that we know. Hopefully they don't have to go through any of that, but it makes for a very challenging environment for these young guys um, and a number of, uh, of things they're going to have to go through in their first season. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, clubs that own their stadiums in Italy, Juventus, Atalanta, Sassuolo, and Udinese. So, you know, the narrative there for clubs that own their stadiums is with four there in Serie A at least. All right, we're going to take a quick break if you're listening to this on audio, but if you're on YouTube, we want to keep on rolling because we have now the players, the American male players that were already there establishing that development, at least at this point as 2021 2022 City A uh, season kicks off. Stay right here. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Heath Pierce in the house. Heath, let's talk now about Weston McKinney. Clearly, the most important, I would say, at this moment, uh, American player in the USMNT that's playing in Italy. His sophomore season now, after racking up 46 appearances, six goals, and three assists in all competitions. Last time around, he scored a beautiful goal in preseason versus uh, Cesana, underscoring his development in the attacking third. Pirlo is out. Max Allegri is in. First of all, Heath, what does that mean for McKenney? do you think? I, I don't know what that means for McKinney. Allegri is <laughs> such an unpredictable... If you, read some of the, if, you, if, if you read some of the things on him, it, it's just like... One part he believes in sports science, the other part he calls it BS. And yeah. like he's like all about being on the field and looking at a player in the eyes and knowing whether they're they're good and ready and fit and prepared and able to deliver for the team. Yeah. So there's certainly he, he you know, and and because of that, I don't know, we won like six championships at Juventus or something like that. Uh, he obviously has a track record of of of, of delivering on his philosophy and belief system. Uh, he, he's obviously. Uh, got a lot of competition in the midfield. I think showing that uh, late run attacking minded um, versatility certainly helps find him as a consistent player on the field. You know, you're when you're looking at a, at a Juventus, <clears throat> you're talking about a team that's playing what 60, 70 games potentially a year. And so, you know, Weston was a was a fill in. And when he was healthy, was was constantly having to play as you go through the rotation and resting of a squad with his age, I think that plays into his advantage. And so with regard to Allegri, obviously Allegri wants to see a lot of uh, attacking output out of him. Um, and I think Weston has shown that obviously scored a really nice goal in, in a preseason match of, you know, going past a couple of players. So he's shown this improvement that before we didn't always see. And, and he's a different player that we saw uh, in the nation's league, uh, CONCACAF nation's league final. He really rose to that challenge. And so he's seemingly embracing the role of having to, take on more pressure and take on more responsibilities, both at the club and international level. Well, he's competing with Ramsey, Rabio, Bentacur, Arthur. There's going to be a lot of competition. By the way, Allegri is just a winner, right? I mean, listen, he's old school, but he wins five Serie A titles, five Scudettos with Juventus, four Coppa Italias, two Supercoppa Italianas, and runner-up of the Champions League. That's the one that he still wants, um, you know, specifically with this club. Uh, twice, runner-up twice, as I believe, with with Juventus. So I think he's going to be, you know, looking for direct answers, right? Aggressive, direct answers, and specifically that will come from his midfield. So Weston McKinney at Juventus in this season, I think, is going to be pivotal, especially Heath, because as we mentioned at the beginning, World Cup qualifiers are coming thick and fast. Yeah, and you add that to a schedule as well. And, and you know, I think Allegri also is is willing to adapt to the game with the players that he has. He's he's shown a willingness to not say, I'm 4-3-3 only or or 3-5-2 mm. or 3-4-3 or whatever they call every formation. Now, everything is a new, a new like pivot, double pivot and whatever. But he changes his 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 setup and his system of play still has similarities, but his actual formation. So what you see at the start of a game when the team is standing on the field for the kickoff can be different. Um, and I think that, Again, 
plays into the advantage of a Weston McKinney who's showing more versatility and a willingness to be able to play. Maybe your uh, start, starting point is a little higher in the midfield. Maybe you're a little bit deeper. Maybe you've got to sit in as a holding midfielder like he did at times for, for Schalke. So all of that, I think, will play well for him over the season to be a, a key contributor. But certainly the, the names you mentioned are, are, are you know, uh, really high-level competition. But they play enough games and and uh, that that just like last year. And I'm going to tell you something. I lost a bet for a significant amount of money that Weston was going to play more than or start more than 50% of his games. I still don't know the exact number of the games he started in, um, in, in the league, but it was more than that because I was just sort of like, he's a good player, but like, yeah. you know, this is, this is Juventus. This is a team that you, you might get a chance and, and you're out. And when we saw Sergio Des sort of find his way out of the team for a little bit at Barcelona, you're like, exactly. This is, these are huge clubs. So you make a mistake. You know, you're not up to par. You could find yourself buried and then on loan within a month or yeah. with the next window, you know? And and so, yeah, I, I was actually really impressed with him. And I think that he's continued to show a willingness to get better. Um, And and yeah, I'm enjoying it. You're not giving me the full amount that you lost because you don't want your wife to listen <laughs> yeah. to this or watch this and then get into major trouble. So yeah. Don't worry, I'm not going to get you into trouble there. And by the way, Juventus is not the defending champion of Serie A. So, the, you know, the impatience from a manager that you speak of and, uh, you know, the forgiveness that, that they'll give to their players is not going to be that substantial this time around because they want to win and they want to win right now. All right, let's finish off with uh, Heath. Here's a player that to me is the one, the most intriguing one because just of the entire narrative that's happening here. Brian Reynolds, Roma, 20 years old, another Texas native. Um, he just just five appearances. I mean, he was just getting warmed up to Serie A last season. But now the problem is... Oh, could be a problem, maybe not. I don't know, depending on how you look at it. Jose Mourinho is not necessarily known for being akin to helping young players, right? I, I don't want to be too critical of that, but Mourinho definitely has his own plans and ideas. We know that Tammy Abraham is on his way there. Obviously, Brian Reynolds doesn't play up front, but regardless, uh, you know, there were reports that Roma did turn down offers to sell him this summer, so it would seem that they want to keep some interest in that he's going to be competing uh with florenzi as well because we're hearing about florenzi as well and also uh rick kosdorf for the right back uh, position he made his yeah. usmt debut in march against northern ireland listen the, i mean we're talking mckenny we know you know mckenny has to basically try not to lose his spot right ryan reynolds is trying to really now regain his his thing and by the way fabrizio romano did mention that uh, Florenzi potentially leaving for Juventus. So that might help him. Yeah, I mean, when you're looking at Karsdorp, uh, another player came from Feyenoord, went on loan back to Feyenoord, came back, is now back. That's yeah. that's a starting job that I think Brian Reynolds could could aspire to compete for uh, if, if Florenzi leaves. But obviously, if Florenzi's there, um, you don't really, I mean, this is a guy who came on in the final, right? Of, of the Euros. It's, it's not, a, it's not like a, a somebody that you're like, Oh, I compete for a couple of spots. That's it. That's, that's, that's his position. And he, and you know, he'll, he'll, you know, put his foot through your shin. If you're trying to take it from him, I think that's a good challenge for, for, for Reynolds. But if you have the three of them, even as an understudy could be good for a season and then he moves on. And if he goes, then you, then you have that, that, that competition, the problem is, is Jose Mourinho is much more of like a, those players got to stand up on their own. They've got to find a reason to develop. They've got to, it's not a nurturing environment, potentially. I could be wrong about Jose Mourinho, and maybe he has a staff around him that's spending more time with um, Reynolds to develop him as a player, but that's the one I'm most worried about. Uh, there's still potential for him in the national team. There's not a ton of depth, uh, but when you start to think beyond Serginho Dest, and then you look at Shaq Moore, and then you look at Reggie Cannon, and now you're looking at Brian Reynolds. Mm. He's got a long way to prove himself for this current cycle. Now, maybe he finds himself starting within a few weeks if 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 the right circuit pieces fall into place, and maybe he's had those conversations of, "Hey, we're going to try to move on, move Florenzi, and you know he, he's going to go somewhere else, and you'll compete for a spot. We need you to rise to that type of challenge." That could quickly change where he falls into the pecking order if, if he's playing regularly at Roma. This is a massive club, right? And when you compare that to Reggie Cannon or Shaq Moore, both playing at smaller clubs and and both sort of showing the type of player they are and showing that they're international quality, but 
you're playing at Roma, you, you're, you're, you're definitely putting out um, an energy that, that you can compete at a, at a higher level, at an international level, as at a European sort of Europa League, Champions League level. So I think that's where his uh, growth could come very quickly uh, that we n we're not currently seeing. And, you know, we've, we've, we've sort of seen that with other players um, coming into to bigger clubs in the same way as Weston McKinney going to Juventus where you go, I don't know if he can do that. So if he can step to, up to that challenge, um, that could change things very quickly. But I think your first hurdle is, is getting on the, the right side of Jose Mourinho, uh, who's not, as you mentioned, a huge fan of, of playing young players or, or even player development for that matter. He'll certainly play a young player if he feels that they're worthy of it, but he's not going to give them a spot to develop them. Um, yeah, it's he, he's the biggest question mark for me for this cycle and one that I worry about what happens in a year and then two years and then three years, right, at this club. I think he signed like a five-year contract or something like that. What happens when he doesn't find his way into a first team? And now we've got a 23-year-old who was at Roma at 19, or I'm, I'm not sure how old he is. I don't know if you have that in front of you, but... Um, Brian you know, Reynolds? Yeah. 20 years old. 20 years old. So yeah, you go a couple years, right? And you've now lost all these years of development trying to get into a team. That's okay for a goalkeeper for those first few years. But for him, yeah. it's one of those ones where if they've turned down offers, I'm wondering why. And and hopefully he gets his chance to prove himself. And and then he he, he rounds the corner. We saw the same thing with Conrad De La Fuente, right? I, he came into the national team. I was like, not really national team quality. Now he's at Marseille and you look at him, you're like, this is a completely different person, right? Obviously came from the La Masia, the Barcelona B. And then he's at, and you see how good he is. He comes in the national team, looks uncomfortable. Now he's at Marseille after a couple of games. You're like, okay, this is a really good uh, league on player. And the same thing could happen for Brian Reynolds. Came into the national team, haven't really been convinced of that quality or seen that potential yet, uh, other than that that pure athleticism and and sort of raw uh, potential. And now you want to see that sort of come to life um, week in and week out, and and him find that ground to show that 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 he's capable of competing. With Serginho Des for for a spot in the national team. Huge year for Brian Reynolds. I think uh, that's the upper, that's the headline. I think uh, you know, twenty years old, Roma new manager. Let's see what happens. We want to finish off, by the way, but just emphasizing just how influential uh, Americans are in this league. We mentioned the players, but Venezia is not the only American-owned club. AC Milan, Elliott Management has ninety-six percent stake. We've discussed Roma. You know, now Dan Fried can. It's got like five hundred ninety million dollars to uh, he paid to previous owner James Pelota, uh, you know, to be part of this enterprise. Uh, Fiorentina, by the way, Rocco Benito Comisio as well. Spezia, Robert Platic also owns uh, the Danish top tier club Sonderjerski. Sonderjerska. Um, Sonder yeah, Sonder Sonder yes. Say it again, Heath. Sonderjerska. Look at that, Sonderjerska football. There you go. And Portuguese second division outfit Casa Pia AC. Uh, not in Serie A, but Catania as well. You mentioned Joe Tocopina, uh, you know, former Venezia, Roma, Bologna, and an honorable mention as well to the Canadian in the mix, Bologna, as you said, uh, Giuseppe Joey Saputo, who was Montreal. This is a big deal, Serie A, right now. There's a lot of American. We need to see more. What do you think we're going to see? Uh, urban outfitters uh, all yeah. over Milan, you think? Uh, what, what, what? <laughs> It's it's uh, I just love the fact that we had all of these guys full names in them because like you don't hear um, Rocco Benito uh, um, Camiso, yeah. right? You just hear Rocco well, Camiso because he's, own, he's, he's, he's the owner Chris of. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. I love I love I love the full names. It's so good. And he's Best obviously Morris owner of. Around, baby. Yeah, yeah, he's owner of of the New York Cosmos. That was his pride and joy as that started to fall apart with NASL and then what would happen with NISA and some of these other leagues and sort of their part in the landscape shifted his focus and ended up buying a club in Syria is actually pretty well loved early on. Um, you know, he is very much a hands-on owner wants to live there and, you know, kiss foreheads and hug fans and all those types of things. But again, you have to have a very, it's a very difficult balance to have with, with a fan base to make sure you're bringing in players, investing in the club, respecting the club's history and, and, and all of that. So, uh, yeah, but, uh, uh, I think, it's what they do with these investments that's going to dictate how these fans respond. We obviously know in Europe, uh, fans are powerful. Fans, yeah. and and they should be, right? They 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 have a responsibility to the history of the club. You know, players come and go, ownership can come and go, but these fans are second, third, sometimes fourth generation fans of these clubs. And so uh, they have a real power. And when they're displeased, have the ability to disrupt things uh, both on the field and, and, and off. We saw some of the, the transfers this window of just like fans protesting outside of training grounds and trying to block things and all that sort of stuff. And so 
Uh, it's got to be a that, Heath, the Super League is a perfect example on how powerful the fan voice can be. I mean, mm -hmm. it's 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 big, massive. Absolutely right. Yeah. Um, there, there's no doubt about it, especially in Italy and how, you know, the history really connects everything from the club to the fan base, to the town, to the city. It's it's very community driven in many of these occasions. I don't want to leave, though. We've talked about American players but we need to remember that probably the most important CONCACAF player, at least one of them, arguably one of them, is Chucky Lozano. And what he's doing, and hopefully what he'll do at Napoli, now that uh, Luciano Spalletti is the manager, Napoli obviously not just trying to Champions League it, but to win it. And Chucky Lozano, Mexican player, horrible injury obviously during the Gold Cup, but hopefully he'll come back stronger and better for Serie A, Heath Pierce. Chucky Lozano is another one that needs to be mentioned in, in, in this conversation. Yeah, phenomenal player. And one that has been so consistent for Napoli that you don't, you know, a lot of players in, in CONCACAF, you look every single week to see, did they feature on the weekend? Did they Are they mm -hmm. going to play in the Champions League squad? He is a, a starter at a huge club and one that you go to watch because you know he's going to play, which I think is a uh, a different type of mentality uh, to play consistently like that. And for us fans of of the growth of the game in North America, it's rare to have a player like that playing at a club where you don't you don't look every single like because we get nervous, right? Is Christian Pulisic going to play at Chelsea every weekend? We don't know. And obviously Chelsea's a different level, but you you look across the board. Is Weston McKinney going to start on the weekend for 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 Juventus? Chucky Lozano is a starter at a huge club and a contributor and one of their best players, which is an incredible thing. So it definitely needs mentioning in terms of of, of a player that's driving a lot of uh, the growth of uh, of the sport in in North America. Yeah, absolutely right. And we wanted to end it with that. Heath Pierce, you brought the knowledge today. I love it. The commentary said he ah is on Paramount Plus and CBS Sports. It's going to be one of many episodes as well as we look ahead to the season debut. Uh, Heath, last final thoughts before we say goodbye, before we say arrivederci. I don't know, man. I, I, I Are Juventus going to win the title this year? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I don't know. Like, this is what's <laughs> making Serie A fun again. Like, imagine this conversation. Uh, well, I guess it didn't work out. If we would have had it a year ago, it wouldn't have worked out in the end. But we were talking about it for long periods. Oh, yeah, eventually Juventus round the corner and other teams fall off and they don't have the depth and then they run away with it. Now we don't know. Like, uh, we don't know. And, and that's know what, what makes Fabrizio this Serie Romano said, Fabrizio huh. Romano said that he's putting some a lot of weight on Atalanta this season. You, you never know. You never know. Like you said, to your point. I don't know, man. It's like going it. to be good, but it's going to be very exciting, right? Yeah. It's going to be very exciting indeed. Everybody, thank you for listening. Grazie tutti. Follow us on Twitter, Kigolasso Pod. Subscribe on YouTube and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. Heath Pierce, thank you so much, man. Oh, thanks for having me. Had a lot of fun.